Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Amen. Well, it's a joy to be with you all. Thank you all for having me. Um, I've been encouraged by Restoration Church from afar for a long time now. And I so love Steve and Elizabeth, so it's just a joy to be with them. It's a joy to be with you all. And I've heard a lot of great things about you. Your pastor brags on you a lot, and I know that you guys love God's word. So let me pray for us, and then we'll dive into 1 Peter chapter 4. Father, we ask you to meet with us now. Would you use your word to do only what you can do? Lord, to convict us where necessary to correct us where necessary, and to change us so we can look more like your son, Jesus Christ. And we ask in his name, amen. Amen. Moses Hall was a pastor in Jamaica during the late 1700s. He became a Christian under the ministry of George Lilo. You might have heard of him. He was a former slave who became the first Baptist missionary to take the gospel to the nations from here. And he went to Jamaica in 1783. So many people, slaves and free people, became Christian under George Lilo's ministry. But Lilo faced a lot of opposition while he was in Jamaica from from slave owners who didn't want their slaves to hear the gospel, for example. So George Lilo was often arrested on these false charges and put in prison. During one time when he was put in prison, he left his assistant pastor, Moses Hall, who I just mentioned, to be in charge for a while while he was in prison. And Moses Hall had a trusty assistant named David, who led the prayer meetings. So during these prayer meetings, they had slaves involved, and they also had free people involved, and that was actually forbidden by law in Jamaica at the time. And one night, Local slaveholders broke in, they broke up the meeting, they captured David, who was leading the meeting, and they brutally murdered him. In fact, they even severed his head and put it in the middle of the pole of where they were meeting, of the village. Now that's graphic and shocking, right? And it's, it's even so foreign to us and so far removed from us in the States We know that brothers and sisters throughout the ages and throughout history and even right now across the globe are being persecuted for their faith. And that's the same audience or the same context of 1 Peter that he's addressing here. These elect exiles who are being persecuted for their faith. And he's addressing them throughout this letter as you've been addressing in this series called To Hope. So the Apostle Peter, for our text this morning, he's encouraging these persecuted Christians these elect exiles, and even by way of that, those of us who are in Christ, towards Christian suffering, which means this, to suffer in light of Christ's coming glory, God's approaching judgment, and God's enduring faithfulness. So here's how we'll walk through this text together. Point one, rejoice because Christ will be glorified. Point two, live righteously because God will judge. And point three, 
rest because God will remain faithful. Let's start with verse 12. If you look at verse 12 in your Bibles, you'll see that, that Peter starts this section with the word beloved, which we may not use that much anymore, but what does that basically mean? That means that he's reminding them that they are dearly loved children of God the Father. That's what that word beloved means. And he's even reminding them in that instant that even regardless of the suffering that they're facing, they are still dearly loved children of God, the Father. And we know that these Christians were elect exiles. They were called and chosen by God, as it says in chapter 1. But they were also specifically persecuted for their faith in Jesus Christ. But if they are dearly loved children of God, the Father then why are they suffering in this way? It's a decent question to wonder about. And better yet, why should they expect to suffer, as Peter reminds them of in verse 12? Well, it sounds like here Peter was listening to his Savior, Jesus, when Jesus said this in John chapter 15. He said, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. So Peter had not only seen his brothers and sisters suffering and being persecuted in this way for the sake of Christ, he experienced it himself, and he also saw Christ suffering. And even Paul co-signs this statement in 2 Timothy when, when Paul says that all of us, all of those who want to live a godly life will be persecuted. Now, even that... It's hard for many of us to swallow, and I understand that. We rightly understand that we face suffering in this life, right? I mean, 2020 has been a year marked with suffering in so many different arenas and so many different ways. But the suffering that he's referring to here is specifically because they name the name of Christ. Suffering because they are Christians. If you look at verse 14, you can see an example of that. He says, if you are insulted for the name of Christ, then in verse 16, he says, yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. So suffering in this way, being persecuted for our faith, biblically, historically, and globally is the rule, it's not the exception. So what that means is while persecution should grieve us, it shouldn't surprise us. It shouldn't surprise us. But again, here for us in the States, we we are often surprised, right? We're surprised when persecution comes. uh, Because it hasn't been here um, in a normal way as it is in many other countries in the world. And we rightly count our blessings for that. We're able to meet and gather freely, for example. That's a blessing from God. But what if that changes in the future? How are we going to respond? What about personally? It's possible that that maybe some of us aren't persecuted more personally or, or maybe even ridiculed for our faith more personally, Not just because of our freedoms here in this country, but maybe because we aren't as bold as we ought to be for the sake of Christ. And I don't mean that you're you're opposed or you're you feel like you're persecuted when you're really just kind of mean or 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 proud or or arrogant. I'm not I'm not talking about that, right? We I'm not talking about if you're really just being inconsiderate. We can't claim persecuted if we are not being Christ-like. We can't claim persecution unless we are actually like Christ. But what I mean is, simply for the sake of following Jesus, you're opposed. Peter says, don't be surprised by that, but rejoice. Rejoice. Not in the persecution itself, per se, or the suffering itself. But as he says in verse 12, insofar as you share in Christ's suffering, sharing in Christ's passion. In the early church, they understood that. So even in Acts, for example, 
Uh, the believer said in Acts chapter 5 that they were counted worthy to suffer for the dishonor of the name of Christ. What a statement, right? They believed, as we should believe, that Christ will be glorified. Look at verse 13 in 1 Peter 4. Rejoice insofar as you suffer Christ's suffering, as you share in Christ's suffering, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Through our suffering, beloved, Christ will get his glory. That is a fact. Both now, even when we can't see it, but also later when all of us will see it in full, when we will see his glory. If you don't see it now, you will surely see it later. So suffering should help us to to long for the fact that his glory will be revealed to us one day. So brothers and sisters, as you suffer, don't just look down. Look ahead to the glory that awaits us for those of us who are in Christ. His glory will be revealed. So these persecuted Christians, they were tested in a lot of different ways. They were, they were harmed physically. Many of them were even killed brutally. And they were even insulted as well. Look at verse 14. It says, if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. The name Christian in the early church was actually used as an insult. Most of us don't mind being called Christian. We're we're, we're cool with that. We're fine with that. But a long time ago, it was an insult. It was a diss. Like, you're just a little Christ. That's what people used it for. They were saying, we saw Jesus, and Jesus was a failed revolutionary, so they thought. We saw him down the cross. So what happened to him will happen to you. And they looked at these early groups of Christians as just this fringe group of followers. It's like, your fate is going to be Jesus' fate. That's what's going to happen to you. But Jesus told us about that, didn't he? He said it very early on in his ministry in the the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. He said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you. When others revile you and when they persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, he says, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So listen, it's not true that when you become a Christian, everything gets fine and better. That's not true. That, that you will instantly, instantly get everything that you want when you want it, how you want it. That you get all the stuff that you want. That you will have a suffering-free life. That's actually a false gospel. That is not true. And many of us know that by experience, right? We've been, some of us, opposed directly because we do name the name of Christ. Maybe you're the only one in your family that's a Christian. And you struggle with that. It seems like regardless of whatever you do or whatever you say or how godly or Christ-like that you are, you're just constantly opposed and teased and you're broken down day after day after day. Maybe you're a student, and, and I know school's a little bit different right now, but, but even as a student, you're trying to follow Jesus. You're trying to do what's right, and because of it, you lost friends or you just get made fun of, whether in person or, or in social media. Or maybe, maybe someone's wrongly assumed your, your views on a position of the day, pick a position, simply because they know you're a Christian. So they've canceled you. Rejoice and be glad. The Spirit will comfort you while you are being persecuted. And again, that doesn't mean that it feels good. But that's why we need the Spirit. That's why the Holy Spirit is a comforter to us. 
even in times of persecution. That's why the Holy Spirit reminds us of the truth of God's word and reminds us of the promises of God and the words of Jesus. So rejoicing while you're suffering doesn't mean that you throw a party when you're being persecuted. It's not what it means. It means that you have joyful contentment because you are resting and trusting in the promises of God. That's what it means. Here's how Russell Moore put it. He says, Jesus has promised us in the short term a cross on our backs. But Jesus also has promised us in the long term a crown of life. A crown of life. Dear brothers and sisters, if you are suffering, remember that glory is coming. Christ will be glorified. And in that fact, you can rejoice. Peter follows up this first section about their their rejoicing, their inward contentment and trusting in Christ with a bit of a warning about how they should outwardly live and also a reminder of the judgment that is coming. So point two, live righteously because God will judge. Live righteously because God will judge. Suffering, any kind of suffering as a Christian has a way of sort of clouding our memory, right? Again, in the midst of it, we forget about God at times. We forget that that God is just, that God will judge rightly. So Peter wants them and us to be reminded that, that we are called to live righteously and leave judgment up to the Lord. Because he's a good judge. We have verses 15 and 16 with me. I'll read them. 1 Peter 4. Yet, uh, if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But, verse 15, let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a meddler. And if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. So Peter here is contrasting the ways that we can suffer. He's comparing suffering for the name of Christ, which is righteous suffering, which is Christian suffering, with the suffering of taking on other names like murderer or thief, or evildoer, or meddler. And in light of the context and what's going on here, that's a pretty remarkable statement. He's basically saying to them that your brothers and sisters have been stolen from, but don't steal. Your brothers and sisters have been murdered, but don't murder in return. People are doing all sorts of evil against you because of the name of Christ, but don't return evil for evil. That's what he's saying. He's saying, live righteously and don't retaliate. Leave judgment up to the Lord. So they shouldn't be ashamed of this this persecution that they're facing, and they should glorify God in their conduct, in how they live, in their righteousness. And so should we. Now, when we see and hear lists like that in the Bible where it, for example, when it says, uh, don't be a murderer or an evildoer or a thief, we tend to, you know, go through our mental checklist, right? Like, all right, I haven't murdered. I'm good. Haven't stolen or at least I haven't been caught yet. Cool. Good. Um, And that's a little bit more gray, but we we won't even get into that, right? Uh, So check, check. The evildoer, well, I mean, no one's investigating my thoughts, so, you know, I'm all right. But then what do we do about meddling? It's like, what is this, Scooby-Doo or something? Like, come on. What does it even mean to meddle? It basically means to mind other people's business. And we don't do that now, do we? 
I mean, social media makes it really easy to do that, right? Some of us actually should be working for the government, the way that we're able to investigate and dig in and find everything that there is to know about an issue and what everybody else thinks about it, right? But, but seriously, maybe we also meddle in different ways. Maybe we meddle by, by comparing our lives to other people's lives, especially those who are not Christians. While we may be persecuted for our faith, they seem to be prospering. We can't talk about Jesus at work. We can't share the gospel where we work, but everyone else can say whatever they want, whenever they want. We can rightly object to those things, but let's be careful that we're not meddling. Let's not return evil for evil. Let's entrust ourselves to the Lord, even in the midst of that form of persecution. In light of all this talk about persecution this morning, I think it's appropriate to ask this question that we all should reflect on. Here's the question. What has following Jesus cost you? Even if you're watching this online, I want you to think about that. What has following Jesus cost you? Maybe following Jesus has has cost you to forsake and say no to that sin that, if you're honest, you really, really love, and sometimes you still do. Maybe it's cost you a job that you can't take or you can no longer do in good faith and good conscience. Or maybe relationships because you've been rejected and separated from people and and you just are, are, are ridiculed for the sake of Christ. Maybe you know what that's like. And again, for many Christians around the world, following Jesus actually does cost them everything. I heard a sermon recently about a a pastor who was preaching in the Middle East. And at the end of this sermon, he noticed a a young Muslim man who he had seen from time to time come up to him. And he came up to him after the service was over. And this young man basically told the pastor that he wanted to follow Jesus. So the pastor grabbed a couple of the elders and and they, they talked with him. They asked him questions. And this young man seemed to know a lot about the Bible. He seemed to, to, to be able to share what the gospel was. He seemed to get the gospel right. He seemed to be sincere in wanting to follow Jesus. So the pastor asked him, what's, what's been taking so long? You seem like you got it. You seem like you've been wanting to do this for a while. And here's what the young man said to the pastor. He said, my father told me that if I become a Christian, he will beat me. So tonight, I will bleed. So I'll ask you again, brothers and sisters, what has following Jesus cost me? It may not be everything. It may not be physical harm. But it should be something. It should be something. And know this, that whatever the cost may be, or whatever the cost will be, the cost of following Jesus also pays. It does cost to follow Jesus, but it also pays to follow Jesus. We are called to live righteously because God will judge. Verse 17 and 18. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So Peter refers all throughout this letter of 1 Peter to the fiery trial that they were facing at various points. That fire, though, that he's talking about isn't just one that burns. For the Christian, it's a fire that perfects and purifies. 
So you think the back, back to verse 12. He says, part of the reason why we shouldn't be surprised at the suffering that is coming upon us is because God uses our suffering. And he uses it to purify us, to perfect us, to make us more like his son, Jesus Christ. He does that for the whole household of God. And his work will be a completed work. What he started, he will finish. So when you are suffering, you are being perfected to look more and more like Jesus. But what about those who aren't part of the household of God? Verse 17 asks it this way. What will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel? Similar to in verse 18 when he, when he says, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Including those who are doing the persecution, by the way. What will become of them? In short, they will be rightly judged by a just God. The God that created the whole world and everything in it and all people in it. He's good and he's faithful and he is just. And he made us, all of us, every single one of us in his image and for his glory. Problem is, we want our own glory. We're glory thieves, as some people say. And we live for our own will, for our own desires. We've sinned against God in our words, in our actions, in our thoughts, in our inactions. We've sinned against God and each other. And because God is holy, he must punish sin and sinners. And that punishment is not only final, it is just. And that fire does burn. And if that were all of it, there would be no hope for any of us. But God is not only just, he is merciful. And that's why he sent Jesus, fully God and fully man, to come to reconcile sinners to him. And Jesus lived a sinless life, a perfect life. But he also died a sinner's death on the cross, taking on the full wrath of God, taking on all of our sin, taking on all of our shame and what, what we actually deserve, he took it on. But we also know what happened on the third day, amen? He rose victoriously from the grave, conquering sin, conquering death, and conquering hell so that all of us who will put our faith in Jesus Christ alone for salvation can know him as the just and the justifier. We can be forgiven of our sins. We can be made new and we can be reconciled to the Lord. And if you're here this morning or if you're watching Uh, this online, and you don't believe that to be true of you. You don't consider yourself to be a Christian. Let me tell you that God is just, and his judgment is coming, but his mercy is more. God's justice and his mercy meet on the cross of Jesus Christ. You can turn to Jesus Christ in faith today. Now, brothers and sisters here at Restoration Church would love to talk to you more about what that means. But for us Christians, those of us who already believe this fact, who know that this is true, notice that Peter doesn't just say believe the gospel. He says obey the gospel. Now, we aren't saved by our obedience. We are saved by faith and through grace and Christ alone. But our obeying the gospel basically means it's our obedience to the gospel through our faith and through our repentance. The gospel demands our faith and our holiness. It's not a get out of hell free card. God wants us to walk with him. So Christian, when you sin and when you stray, because you will, And maybe as you're listening now, you already have. You still have a loving and gracious and merciful father who wants to be merciful towards you. 
Don't turn away from him. Don't run away from him. You can run towards him and find the mercy and help that you need because of what Jesus has already done for us. You can even find the grace and help to live a righteous life. So since God is judge, we can live righteously even while we suffer because we trust that he is the just judge and he will judge correctly. In verse 18, Peter uses a reference from Proverbs chapter 11, where he asks, if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Now, the scarcely saved part doesn't mean that Jesus' finished work on the cross wasn't enough for our salvation. That's not what he's talking about. What he means is, he's reminding the believers of how much they actually needed Jesus in the first place which many of us sometimes can tend to forget. So in other words, Christian, you didn't need just a little bit of Jesus in your life. You didn't need just a little bit of the blood of Jesus Christ sprinkled on top of your goodness and your good works. You and I were not merely on life support. The Bible says we were dead in our sins and trespasses, but God made us alive in him. You didn't just need help. You needed saving. Pastor H.B. Charles puts it this way. He says, in salvation, we do our part, God does his part. We do the sinning and God does the saving. We do the sinning and God does the saving. He's good, amen? Amen. Amen. So briefly, to live righteously, what does that mean? We talked about that a lot. Know the sermon preached already a couple weeks ago on 1 Peter 7, uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. That would be good to go back and listen to and remind ourselves of this. Peter's saying this in one thought. He's talking about our righteous living. But just quickly, here's some things he's saying from verses 7 through 11 about our righteousness. He says to pray fervently, to love earnestly, to show hospitality, and to serve generously. Pray fervently, love earnestly, show hospitality, and serve generously. That's how we live, in part, a righteous life before God. Brothers and sisters, God is a just judge, and he will judge righteously. So we can live righteously and leave final judgment up to the Lord. He's faithful to do it, which leads us to our last point. Point three, we can rest even while we're suffering because God remains faithful. God remains faithful. Verse 19, 1 Peter chapter 4. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Verse 19 of of 1 Peter chapter 4 basically is a summary of the entire section, and in some ways it could summarize the whole book. Let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Tell us about suffering according to God's will, which is Christian suffering. We're suffering for the name of Christ. We're suffering righteously for the sake of his glory. As we talked about before, God uses suffering and he uses it to purify his people and to refine the household of God. He even mentions this earlier, Peter does in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 through 7, where he says, In this you rejoice. Though now, for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested through fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. God is present and active throughout our suffering. God is present and active throughout 
our suffering. So we can rest in him because of that. We can, we can rest in him in part by giving our burdens over to Jesus. As he says so sweetly in Matthew chapter 11, Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and are heavy laden and are burdened, and I will give you, what does he say? Rest. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. His gentleness and lowliness has not changed one bit, beloved. And he also says this, and you will find rest for your souls. Rest for your souls. So Peter says here, we can entrust our souls to him. We can rest in him, trusting that all his promises will remain true because God remains faithful. He's a faithful creator, as verse 19 says. Think, think Peter here using that phrase of faithful creator. He's appealing to not only God's faithfulness, but also his sovereignty, right? As God's the creator. He existed before crea- creation. He was not created. No one created God. He doesn't need anything or anyone. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's been faithful since the very beginning and will remain faithful throughout all of the ages and until the end of time, and even in glory, he remains faithful. God is faithful and remains faithful. Often when you and I are, are suffering or we're going through a hard time, whatever that hardship is, uh, a brother and sister will rightly appeal to us um, if in that same way. They will appeal to God's sovereignty. They'll remind us, hey, God is in control. Have you heard that before? Have you shared that with someone before? That's absolutely true, isn't it? That's, that's basically what it means when we say God is sovereign. He is in control. He didn't just create and take a nap. He's active and present and has been before the beginning. So it's good and right that we tell each other and remind each other, even when we're suffering, that God is in control and that hasn't changed. But let's not isolate God's sovereignty from his other attributes. Here's what I mean. If God were sovereign, but evil, that wouldn't be any good for us, would it? If God were sovereign, but did not love us, how would that actually help us or comfort us? That is not good news all by itself, but the fact that God is not only sovereign, but he's faithful, and he's good, is good news for us. Psalm 119, verse 68, it's a, it's a very short and sweet verse. I think everyone can memorize it, even the kids in the room. Remind us about God's goodness. Here's what it says. You are good, and you do good. Teach me your statutes. A good reminder for us that God is good, God does good, so then therefore we need to learn from his word. Yes, God is in control, beloved, but that, and that will not change, but God is also good. He's also faithful, and his faithfulness will remain and will endure forever. That's why we can entrust our souls to him. Not just our life here on earth, we can entrust our souls to him to him because he's a faithful creator. And that's why also, even through suffering, we can rejoice and we can do good and we can live righteously. And like in our final point, all that collectively means we can rest in him. We can rest even when it's hard. Remember the beginning of our Our sermon, I told you a little bit about Moses Hall, right? And what happened to him, specifically what happened to his friend David for hosting a prayer meeting back in Jamaica in the late 1700s. Let's pick up the story. Moses Hall, after the murder of David, was captured by these slaveholders. 
and he was taken to where the remains of his friend David were. And he was interrogated. One of the murderers murderers asked Moses, he said, whose head is on this pole, Moses? David's, he replied. Do you know why he's up there? For praying, sir, he said. No more of your prayer meetings. If we catch you at it, we will serve you as we have served David. And as the crowd watched, Moses Hall knelt beside the pole and said, let us pray. Let us pray. The other believers that were with him, they gathered around him and they prayed for the salvation of those that were persecuted. And that killed their friend and brother, David. What an example of Christian suffering. What an example of Christ-like endurance through suffering. Hope that God will do everything that he said he's going to do. Restoration Church, brothers and sisters here, and if you're watching online, regardless of what suffering has come our way or will come our way, may we decide to rejoice. May we decide to live righteously, and may we rest. And we can do that because Christ's glory is coming. God's judgment is sure, and God's faithfulness endures forever. Let's pray together. Father, we We ask that you would help us, all of us, through any suffering that we are facing currently or will face in the future, that we will entrust our souls to you, knowing that in doing so, we are in the best hands possible. Your love is strong, O Lord. Your grip is tight, O Lord. You will not let us go if we are in you, O Lord. Or help us to rest in you. Help us to help our brothers and sisters rest in you. Or help us to live righteously. Help us to do what you call us to do, regardless of what anyone and everyone are doing around us. Help us not to repay evil for evil, but to bless those who persecute us. And Lord, we ask that you would help us to rejoice even while we are suffering. Not because suffering is easy, but because we trust that you are there with us and we trust that Christ will be glorified and we long for the day when we will see his glory in full. We need your help, O Lord, to do this. And we trust that you are faithful to help us. In Jesus' name, amen.